Well, good evening. We are glad that you are here with us on this night that we call, or this day that we call Good Friday. And I was thinking about it a lot um, today and just thinking about how many years ago it wouldn't have seemed that good. But, but we're on this side of, of history, and so we understand why it's a Good Friday. And, and so whether you're a guest here, we want to welcome you. Uh, if you're here in person or if you're joining us online, we also want to welcome you to this Good Friday service, where one of the things we're going to be doing is at the end of the service, or towards the end of the service, we'll be celebrating communion. And, and Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that, that we celebrate communion, and every time we do that, we, what we're doing is we're proclaiming the death of Jesus until he comes, right? So that's, that's why it's a Good Friday, is because Jesus didn't stay in the grave, but he... We know Sunday's coming, and Jesus rises from the dead, and he then will come back again. And so we're excited to celebrate and think about that as we reflect on, on all that happened uh, so many years ago. So we're going to rise to our feet, and we're going to start to by singing um, some praise songs to, to God. Yeah. 
Well, it was a different kind of Passover meal, to say the least. I remember when I sat down, Philip leaned over to me and he whispered this. Hey, Thomas, I feel like something special is going to happen tonight. I looked at him and said, I doubt it. I was wrong. Jesus gets up from the table. He walks over and grabs a basin of water and a towel. I remember at the time thinking to myself, what is Jesus doing with some of the foot water? I doubt he's going to wash somebody's feet tonight. I was wrong. Jesus walks over to Bartholomew, kneels down next to him, and starts washing his feet. Bart just sat there. He didn't say anything. He didn't even move. Actually, none of us did. After Jesus was done washing his feet, he got up and went over to James and washed his. Then he went over to Andrew and washed his feet as well. Eventually, Jesus washed all of our feet. I couldn't help but think to myself, this is strange, yet so wonderful. But I doubt anyone is going to say anything about it right now. I was wrong. You know who broke the silence that night. It was Peter. Then Jesus took some bread and some wine. He blessed it and served it to us. He told us that it was a sign of a new covenant with his blood. He also told us, tonight all of you will lose faith in me. I remember thinking to myself, lose faith in you? Never. But I didn't say anything. 
Instead, I just sat there. I couldn't just sit there. I had to say something. So I looked at him and I said, Jesus, I love you. You can count on me. Everyone else may fall away, but I will not. You can count on me. And then he looked at me, smiled. When we got to the garden, a lot of things happened that I just didn't understand. Jesus asked Peter, James, and myself to go further into the garden with him and pray. So we did. Well, we tried. But we kept falling asleep. Jesus would come by and, and wake us up. And I remember one time Jesus saying, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's true. It's all such a blur. And to think this all started because of Judas. Did he really think he was doing the right thing? There, there he is. He's the one you want, the one praying by himself. Now the others, they will try to come up and create a scene. But the one that I kiss on the cheek, that's the one you want. Now, 30 pieces of silver for this, right? 30 pieces, that's what we agreed upon. Now forget about the rest. The one I kiss on the cheek, that's the one you want. A kiss? Judas really betrays Jesus with a kiss. Then things got really crazy. Peter, he grabs a sword and cuts off this guy's ear. And Jesus, Jesus just walks up, bends down, picks up the ear, and puts it back on the guy's head. Like nothing had happened. And then... Then they took him. I wish I could say that we stayed and fought for him, but we didn't. Everyone ran. I ran. I'm so ashamed. What have I done? What have I done? Was I so stupid to think I've killed him. I've killed him. I've crucified Jesus. makes no sense. There I was, rotting in a jail cell for stealing, murdering, you name it, and I had done it. I knew the next time I stepped foot outside that jail cell, that was it. So the guards, they, they came and got me, and they put me next to this guy who had been beaten to a pulp. And then Governor Pilate started asking the crowd, 
Which one of these men do you want me to set free? I mean, it was obvious. The crowd is going to say, let Jesus go. <laughs> and then I was going to tell them where they could go. <laughs> then the, the crowd, they, they started chanting, Barabbas! I mean, they were saying my name. They were saying my name over and over again. And the, the guards, they pushed me into the crowd and they led this Jesus off to Golgotha. One minute, I'm a man marked for death and then the next minute, I'm free. Made no sense. So then I followed him all the way to Golgotha. I was stationed at Golgotha that day. We had just raised the second criminal by the time they brought him to me. I'll never forget the way he looked. He had been beaten, spit on, whipped. He was unrecognizable as a man, hideous. What was left of his clothes were stripped off him and he was thrown down on the cross and that's when I went to work. Generally, when you crucify a man, the first hand is the most difficult. The criminal wants to get away and he fights you. So I would have two soldiers hold him down. But this guy, he didn't put up a fight. I just thought he was exhausted. As an executioner, I've been called every name in the book. I've had men yell at me, plead with me, but I wasn't prepared for that. He looked at us. He looked at me. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He forgave me. Forgive them. He, he said... Forgive them. Who is he? Forgive? It should have been me up there. I should have been the one hanging on that cross. He took my place. I looked up at him, and I remember he took a deep, agonizing breath, and he said, It is is finished. Then he died. Surely this man was the Son of God. Well, there are more perspectives on who Jesus is and what happened 2,000 years ago than probably on any other person or any other event in all of history. And so what we want to do tonight is just simply look at what happened when Jesus died on that cross. Uh, it's why he died that causes the debate. Nobody argues about whether or not Jesus died on the cross. It's pretty well documented. But it's why he died that causes the debate. This is what uh, Gandhi wrote in his autobiography back in 1894. He said, I can accept Jesus as a martyr. His death on the cross was certainly a good example. But that there was anything else to his suffering, like dying as a substitute for sinners, this my heart can never accept. I think that's the perspective that many people have today. But for those who were there, 
There was no debate, no question. So have you ever wondered why we call Good Friday good? I mean, what's so good about the most violent event in history? Well, it's really simple. Good Friday was for my good. It was for your good. See, if you understand what love means, true love means your good at my cost. And so when you think about God loving you, what, what does that mean? That God loves you means that he'll do good for you and it will cost him. And that's what the crucifixion was all about. See, Good Friday was for your good. Let's pray before we look at Matthew chapter 27. Pray with me, please. Father, thank you for giving us uh, a somber evening like this to be able to gather together and reflect on what you accomplished for us. Couldn't be done any other way for you to secure the salvation of all of sinful mankind by taking our place on that cross, taking upon yourself the wrath of God the Father, poured out upon sinful creation. That's what we deserve. That's what I deserve. I deserve to suffer for my sin, to die for my sin. But you made a way because of your love, because of your perfect good justice to have your son be my substitute. So God, we can't thank you enough. Uh, boy, something in our brain just short circuits trying to understand the depth of your love for us in, in giving your one and only son to die a brutal, agonizing death on that cross, to pay the price that I deserved, to be able to secure for us eternal salvation. Father, I would pray for anyone here this evening that has not yet experienced trusting Christ as their Savior. God, I pray that you'd be at work in their heart, knocking upon the door of their heart, that they would find you irresistible, that they would see clearly their need for you as a Savior and would respond in faith to the work that Jesus Christ did for them. Thank you for your love for us, God, and how you demonstrate it. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 27, starting in, in verse 27, says this, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium, gathered the whole garrison around him. They stripped him, put a scarlet robe on him. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him. They mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And then they spat on him, took the reed, and struck him on the head. Well, Good Friday reflection number one. Good Friday is for my good because Jesus, he suffered in my place. See, we're, we're talking right now about before he even hung upon the cross, before his death, the agonizing suffering that went on for hours beforehand. So first in the, in the text, it mentions the whole garrison gathering around him and beating him. A garrison was 20 to 30 soldiers circling him like a mob, kicking him, punching him, mocking him, spitting on him, like the cruelest bullies rallying around a helpless child on a school play, route, play, play yard, or a, a gang fight, delighting in his pain until he was barely conscious. And then when they were finished with that, Jesus would have been barely able to stand, covered in spit, humiliated, quivering in pain, then they took it a step further, and he was flogged. See, the whole process of crucifixion had been designed to put somebody through the worst kinds of pain, but without killing them, without even letting them slip into unconsciousness. They kept them awake. The Persians had actually invented this process. The Romans then took pride in perfecting it. I found an article in the Journal of the American Medical Association that describes the process of flogging that Jesus next went, underwent and, and why it worked the way that it did. T 
talks about how they used a short whip called a flagrum, or it's also known as a cat of nine tails. It has several braided leather thongs with small iron balls at the tip and sharp splinters of sheep bone that are knotted throughout the whip at various intervals. So the victim was stripped of his clothing. His hands were tied high up on a post so that he would be stretched out so that his flesh would be taut and his skin would tear it more easily. Then two soldiers, one on each side, with alternating strokes, would deliver the beating. And the goal was to weaken the victim to a state just short of death or unconsciousness. The article says this, As the Roman soldiers repeatedly struck the victims back with full force, the iron balls would cause deep contusions. The sheep bones would cut into the skin and subcutaneous tissues of the victim. Eventually, the lacerations of the whip would tear into the underlying skeletal muscles and produce quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh. Pain and blood loss generally set the stage for circulatory shock. Well, we pick up in verse 31 of Matthew chapter 27. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. See, Jesus suffered in my place. The penalty for my sin, the penalty for your sin, is death. That's what the Bible says. See, Jesus, in suffering for you, demonstrated the depth of God's love for you, which meant that he had to undergo the full horrors of death in your place. One scholar explained it this way, he said, remember, it was designed, the, the process of crucifixion, to keep the victim alive and in, in as much pain as possible for as long as possible without letting them slip into shock. So it involved dizziness, cramping, thirst, sleeplessness, hunger, traumatic fever, humiliation, shame, piercing wounds, ripped tendons. The way that they kept you conscious was by putting you through cycles of pain. And when one thing was about to make you pass out, crucifixion would make you switch to something else that would keep you conscious. So here's how the actual process of crucifixion worked. You would hang down, suspended by your arms. Your feet were nailed so that they couldn't support you. Suspended by nails through your wrists, your shoulders and elbows would pop out of joint. And as you were hanging, you couldn't breathe. You'd start to suffocate, so you would hoist yourself up by your arms to take a breath, which then pulled on the nails in your hands. And not only did this cause excruciating pain from the nails grinding against the bone, from your shoulders being out of joint, but almost immediately, cramps seized the muscles, and you would have to let go. And from the hanging position, you could draw air into your lungs, but not exhale it. So at that point, you felt like you couldn't hold your breath any longer, and you'd pull yourself up again to take another breath, and down again you'd go. For six hours, Jesus alternates between searing pain and this panicked feeling of suffocation. Each time, pulls himself up or lets himself slide down. His back, remember, lacerated by the whips down to the muscle, down to the bone, would be further torn open by the splintered center beam of the cross. And eventually the, fig, the victim would give up and die by suffocation. Last night, Jesus would have sat around the table with his 12 disciples and would have partaken in what is now known as the Last Supper, his last meal, if you would. So this was what Jesus was pointing to when, if you remember in that Last Supper, he held up the bread and the cup, and he said, this, this represents my body, broken for you, my blood poured out for your sins. Isaiah 53, it says that he was wounded for our transgressions. You know, every seemingly small act of, of rebellion, our, our little white lies, our refusal uh, to let him be in charge, to let him be the center, uh, 
our desire to steal the glory for ourselves, Scripture says he was bruised for our iniquities, that the chastisement of our peace was placed on him. By his stripes we are healed. So at the cross, God absorbed the sting of our sin. He took the wrath, took the devastation that we deserved. And right before he died, Matthew tells us that Jesus uttered two things from the cross. Verse 46, about three in the afternoon, he was on the cross for six hours. Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? See, he's abandoned by God at this point in my place. He suffered in my place. Experienced for the first time in his existence what it meant to be separated from God, what it meant to be forsaken by God. He experienced being forsaken by God in my place because I deserve, you deserve to be forsaken by God. So what started back in Gethsemane has now been brought to completion. And then verse 50, what does it say? Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and he yielded up his spirit. Well, the Apostle Luke tells us here that in, in verse 50, what he said was, it is finished. In Greek, that's the word tetelestai. That's what was written on tax receipts when the debt was paid in full. In other words, Jesus is saying that the payment for your sin has been paid. I paid it off. I paid off your debt. I paid your death penalty. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to experience separation from God in all of eternity in a place called hell. Why? Because I paid the debt that you owe to God because of your sin. Jesus suffered in your place. Well, Good Friday reflection number two. Good Friday is good for me because Jesus not only suffered in my place, he actually died in my place. See, he died in our place as he absorbed the full wrath of God for our sins. Nobody can withstand that. Well, that's what the word propitiation, big, long theological word in the scripture, that's what propitiation refers to. The satisfaction of God's wrath. The answer to God's wrath. Romans chapter 3, verse 25. The apostle Paul puts it this way. He says, whom God, referring to Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation or the satisfaction of wrath. How did that happen? How did he satisfy the wrath of God the Father? Through the shedding of blood, by his blood, through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Well, when we pick back up in the narrative in Matthew chapter 27, after Jesus cries out to tell us that it is finished, what happens? Well, the text tells us that suddenly the curtain of the sanctuary or the temple, was torn in two from top to bottom, that the earth quaked, the rocks were split. Let's talk about this curtain for just a moment. This curtain was four inches thick, huge curtain, woven of 72 blue, red, and purple cords. The curtain sealed off the people from the presence of God in the temple. It stopped people from going into the, the most holy place, only the high priest could enter the most holy place. And only after a difficult, laborious process of ceremonial cleansing. Why? Because the price of our sin is expensive. It is costly. So for him to enter into the presence of the most holy, he had to enter pure. Well, now suddenly as Jesus dies, this four-inch thick Curtain separating mankind from God is split in two, depicting that Jesus' body was torn. It was torn so that now the presence of God was open to all. There was therefore no longer any separation between God and man. See, Jesus was cursed for your sin. He was humiliated 
in your place. He was accused in your place. He was condemned in your place. He was defiled in your place. Beaten, abandoned, mocked, killed in my place. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished, was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah, what a savior. It's the gospel in four words. Jesus in my place. Jesus in your place. So he didn't just merely die for you. He died instead of you. That's what happened. So going back to the night before he gave his life on the cross, he has this one last meal with his disciples. And once again, he foretold his death, and he instituted the practice of communion to help us today, his followers, to keep his sacrifice for us, instead of us, fresh on our minds and in our hearts. So we have a special group that's actually going to come and remind us of this truth. You know, nothing reaches the depths of our hearts like children. And so we've put together a kids' choir that's going to come now and help us prepare our hearts for communion. Thank you, ladies. Outstanding. You know, we can have a relationship with God because of what Jesus Christ did for us. Communion is a sign of the new covenant, or in other words, a new relationship because that veil was torn, because Jesus' body was torn for you and me. He instituted a new covenant. And the mark, the sign of that new covenant was this, this activity that we get to participate in tonight called communion. See, that relationship that we have with God is based on forgiveness. And forgiveness is expensive because the Bible says that there, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or there is no forgiveness for sin. So God requires the shedding of blood 
for the forgiveness of sins. That's the penalty. That's the price. Reminds us of how awful our sin is in God's eyes. And so that's why during communion, we evaluate ourselves. And God's very clear about the seriousness with which we should approach communion. In fact, the one passage he gives a warning to, to two groups of people. Number one, those who don't yet know Christ as their Savior. And number two, those Christians, maybe they have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, but they're still harboring bitterness and resentment toward, maybe toward God or toward others. Maybe there's unconfessed sin. And so scripture says it like this in 1 Corinthians 11. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. And so let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Could that be you? If it is, we're going to take a moment for you to be able to make that right before the Lord. You can ask God right in these moments to forgive you of your sin. 1 John 1, 9 is a promise. Says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse you from your sin and to forgive you from all, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So at this point, I want to invite you to, to head to one of the four stations in the, the corners of the room, and the, the back as well. Um, bring your communion elements back to your seat, and then we'll have a time of private, personal reflection just between you and the Lord. Go ahead, you can go now. Have you no regard, all ye, who pass this way to pity me, who am a man of misery, a man both bruised and broken, bleeding, who suffers here, whose life now fleeting? From death there will be no retreating. Ah, loved ones, dear, do not fear. 
the cross, the cords, the nails, the spear, the myrrh, the gall, the vinegar, for Christ your loving Savior hath drunk up the wine of God's fierce wrath to save you, set you on a different path. But oh, to think upon his mercy new, what bitter cup had been your due had he not drunk them up for you. Back in 1 Corinthians 11, the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And you'll notice on the top of your cup there's a really thin film. You want to peel that back and there's the wafer. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this, is the, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's Friday. Jesus is praying. Peter is asleep. Judas is betraying. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. Pilate's struggling. The council is conspiring. The crowd is vilifying. They don't even know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running like sheep without a shepherd. Mary's crying. Peter is denying, but they don't know that Sundays are coming. It's Friday. The Romans beat my Jesus. They robe him in scar. They crown him with thorns. But they don't know that Sundays come. It's Friday. See Jesus walking to Calvary. His blood dripping, his body stumbling, and his spirit's burden. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The world's winning. People are sinning. And evil's grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers nailed my Savior's hands to the cross. They nailed my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raised him up next to criminals. It's Friday. But let me tell you something. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know. It's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. He's hanging on the cross, feeling forsaken by his father, left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, it's Friday. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday, the earth trembles, the sky grows dark, my king yields his spirit. It's Friday, hope is lost, death has won, sin has conquered, and Satan's just a laughing. It's Friday. Jesus is buried. A soldier stands guard. 
and a rock is rolled into place. But it's fried. It is only fried. Sunday is a coming. An orphan of the shadow. 
uh, lyrics in that song says that he lavishes his grace upon us. I hope that you've experienced that through the shedding of Jesus' blood for you. He suffered in your place. He died in your place. So we have an opportunity now. Actually, what I'm about to say is not, for those of you who are guests with us, this is just a conversation that I'm having between myself and our members, okay? So you can tune me out right now. There are, at each of the tables, our, our communion stations, there are, uh, you might have noticed the, back, the baskets. That's for our deacon's love offering. That's a way that we meet significant needs in our midst. And that's the way, one of the ways that we lavish grace upon each other. And that's an important thing that we do here at our church. We want to love others and show the love of Christ to, to those who are in need. So if you can help us out with that on your way out, we'd appreciate that. Today's Friday, but Sunday's coming. So we hope we'll, we'll see you then. Uh, love for you to, to join us. So with that, may God bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile upon you and show you his grace. May the Lord give you his favor and show you his peace. You're dismissed.